Monday morning when you get up to go to work, you walk out and you go and get on the bus. Would you get on that bus if you knew that that driver had already worked 124 hours without a break, without a day off? I wonder. But that's what we're talking about today. Welcome to the Alan Thurban Show. My guest today is a gentleman who's been in the world of buses for a huge part of his life. 46 years. It was in fact, yes, 46 years. And I'd like to introduce everybody to my good friend, Keith Edgerson, who I had the pleasure of working with for many years. And between us we did a heck of a lot to try to improve the lots of bus drivers who worked alongside us. We succeeded in the main, but unfortunately now, why we don't know, but everything has gone very, very rapidly backwards. And I'm hoping today Keith will be able to tell me what's happened and give us some insight as to why it's happened and how, or if, we can halt the decline. Welcome Keith, pleased to see you again. And you, Alan. Well, firstly, Keith, perhaps you'd like to tell us when did you join the buses and why? I joined it back in the good days of London Transport in 1970. I joined as a conductor and I then progressed to a driver, a driver operator, an inspector, and then a senior supervisor which is equivalent to the gold badge because the actual gold badge, London Transport, made redundant. They then brought in a sideways grade which was the senior supervisor. Right, so we know the conductor, we know the driver. The driver operator, I take it, was when the buses became one main Amen. operator. Okay. Fine. Inspector, yes, we've all seen the inspectors, I believe um, the posh word there is controller. Yep. Well, and the gold badge, I believe, was basically the guy who was the cream of the cream control. You was in charge of your routes to make sure, that you, you had a certain number of routes and you had to make sure that those routes conformed to service requirements. Right, so... Um, it was up to you whether a bus was turned or carried on through or whatsoever to ensure that you had a flow of yes, traffic in each direction. Yes, but also the inspectors, because the inspector could actually monitor what was happening locally, they was all in radio contact with each other. You could, if there was an accident in central London that was affecting south London routes, he would radio you down so you could adjust the service and back into position. Mm -hmm. So whatever the actual roadside official felt was necessary for his domain, he would do. Fine. And then I understand that you left the industry for a while. Um, well, once again, the cutbacks, they were getting rid of the senior grades because um, back in 93 my basic rate of pay was 35,000 a year which was a lot of money then that's why extremely, they, that's, extremely. that's why they got rid of us uh -huh. so yes I left and I went to work for Uh, well, I don't know what you'd call them, um, a transport company um, as a transport manager because I hold all the necessary qualifications. qualifications. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. 
and then you made a reappearance on the buses, I think, um, after I joined the industry. I came back to working for a lovely bus company called British Bus. It was um, still an industry which had um, a core interest in the staff and your passengers were almost friends. Yeah. You know, you got to know your passengers. I used to work all around um, Surrey in West Croydon out to there. I remember those days. Very good. And then unfortunately the company got bought out by Arriva. But these things are hindsight. Um, sorry, carry on. Yeah, no. <laughs> No, that's fine. So you were swallowed up in the Arriva machine. Now, I found Arriva was quite a reasonable company when I joined them. Um, yes. And as we proceeded over the years, things took a turn for the worse when they were swallowed up by a huge European conglomerate. Um, yes, I think what the biggest problem was, most of, when you joined the company, most of the management was London Transport trained and they still had the London Transport mentality of looking after the staff because make no bones about it, London Transport we had a huge um, sports network and the facilities which were offered we had a flying club all these with privatisation started to cease. The sports grounds were privatised off to, don't ask me what happened to the money because these things were owned by the drivers and the conductors, but they, they disappeared, they were swallowed up. Um, and gradually as the old managers was yeah. retired or died, unfortunately, which some of them did, you started to get um, college graduates, people that hadn't got the faintest idea what a bus was, but knew how to make two and two equal six at your expense. Yeah. Um, it's it's very difficult when you look at. Uh, I don't think I'm. I don't disagree with youngsters progressing in the jobs, but when you get somebody who's just come out of university and because I've got a degree, I'm going to be in charge of the whole company. And they haven't got the faintest idea no, they don't. how to even start a bus. No. Um, no idea what goes on well, out on the road. I mean, in, in, a, in our... Uh, position which we had at Croydon Garage, we had to deal with a couple of individuals like that. I'm not going to even mention names. It would be unfair to do so. It, it would, but when he used to turn around and say it was like the Arab-Israeli war, and I always used to tell him, yes, but the Israelis always win. Um, yeah, that was um, <laughs> quite an eye-opener, and when he actually said, but I'm here because I've got a degree, and I said, well, what good is your particular degree, which was something to do with making optical instruments? In running buses. In running buses. You just cannot run buses sitting on your ass if you... You need to know what is taking place out there. And of course, when privatisation came in and TfL came into it and they brought up this wonderful tendering system. Now, the tendering system certainly doesn't help staff. It helps accountants because if I've got a shilling to spend and you'll do the same job for me for sixpence, I'm going to get you to do the job and I've, I've still made sixpence. 
So I've got that in my coffers to go and do something else. The fact that you're going to struggle to do whatever you're doing with that sixpence is frightening. Um, the pressure saved a driver now, as you started off by saying, can do a hundred odd hours before he's going to do maybe 13 days before he has a break. Now 13 days, and the only reason he has a break at 13 days was that there was a very serious accident and a very wise judge looked at what was taking place with these drivers and says, well how come you've been driving for 14 days without a break? Can't have that. So he stuck in that after 13 days you must have a break. I would like to have seen it after 12 days that you must have two days break. And then because you could have broken down the amount of hours and stress and fatigue which they were all being put under. I mean, when I first joined the buses, the average job, we was on a 48 hour week. Mm -hmm. Sounds a lot. But I worked a lot less hours under 48 hour week I do now we're down to a 35 hour week or 38 hour week whichever they are operating on because on that 38 hour week I'm working every hour whereas when it was 48 hours I used to have breaks facilities to enjoy my time off all of this has been eroded it's all gone it's, it's just not there so what you're saying now is it's go to work, get on the bus, get off, have a quick meal, get on the bus, finish, go home. Yeah, basically. Now, if you work um, in the coaching industry, you have to put a tackle in. Tachograph in the, yep. You put your tachograph in your vehicle and then the um, vehicle is checked. All parts of you. But if you was to check your vehicle in, shall we say, 10 minutes, when your vehicle taco is examined by the ministry, which they are quite regularly, they think you're not spending enough time on doing your vehicle checks. They expect to see you take approximately 20 minutes to check a vehicle properly. So that is to ensure it's perfectly road safe, worthy. Uh, yeah. Everything intact, the seats, the lights, yeah, seats, lights, brakes, heating, brakes, leaks, anything yeah. like that, it, you've checked it. Now, when you work on the buses, you swipe on, you get your machine or your module to prepare you for the road, you then go out and you've not got a single decker. Vehicle. It's a double deck. It's a double deck. But you're expected to be out of your garage in 10 minutes from signing on to being actually out on the road. And that's two decks inside and out. out. Every nook, cranny, cranny. brakes, lights. Yep. And you're supposed to make sure that it's, it's there. So unless you're somebody like Usain Bolt we was in the back of your head. Um, you, it, everything is done on a cursory glance. You can see the drivers walking around. Um, you and I have done run-outs to try to slow our colleagues down and teach them how to do it properly. And you know full well that you cannot check the vehicle properly. In 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. Well, or seven minutes by the time you swiped on activated the module to go into the ticket machine, got the duty card and then walked downstairs and filled in all the paperwork yeah, found your bus, filled in the paperwork 
Now you're going to do a walk round check. Yes, you same bolt. Yep. Does come into it. So we've slid down the road that way, but we come back to the part now that whereby, as you say, there is no time on the job. I take it now that um, you're saying that the timings on the jobs are so tight well, that you're getting no time at the end of the run to actually get out of the cab, de-stress, get back in again? Is it just straight so you, turn round? We, we, we'll say that officially, on paper, they give you 46 minutes from West Croydon to Last Sydenham. This is when you get to Lars Sydenham, you should have seven minutes in which to do your required walk round to check that there's nothing been left on the vehicle and no untoward occurrences have taken place, leaks, etc., because they can happen all the time before you leave. The only problem is that it takes 56 minutes to get from West Croydon to Lower Sydney. So when you arrive at Lower Sydney, you're three minutes late. Now, you're now going to get out your bus, walk around, check it, but you're not because behind the bus, our big god, which is a radio system, as you're approaching She's already asking you to depart immediately on your arrival. So you're not standing. So eventually, you might get back to West Croydon. And once again, you're running late. And you're asked to depart again. So theoretically, you could be sat in that cab for the best part of five and a half hours. Without moving. And this is all done in the name of TFL, their tenders, you must be on time. Clock face departures. They want, if, if, if one bus leaves at 10 past, the next one's got to be 20 past. The next one's got to be half past. past. And so on, all the way around. And that's what they want. And all the time it's done like that, then... Arriva gets paid a lovely lot of money from the tender system. If not, they lose cash. Obviously they're fine for that. Yep. But, okay, fine. They rake in the cash. Yep. But basically they don't give a damn about what's happening to the driver. Well, no. The, the driver is expected. I mean, heaven help you if you need to use the toilet facility. You know, Dear, um, there aren't any street toilets now. They're all being very true. shut down. And when you get somewhere like La Sydenham and you've got a very, very good relationship with McDonald's, they will allow the bus staff to use their facilities. Obviously, Keith, then things... You know, since I joined the industry, it was quite a long time ago, um, have gone rapidly downhill. Very much so. I mean, back in the days, um, we just hit on toilets. If, in the old days, a driver needed to go to the toilet in a hurry, he was legally allowed to urinate on his offside front wheel to cool the brakes down. Yeah. I suppose that saved them because at that point we'll just take a short break and be back in a few moments. Pay the money and go.
absolutely wonderful show. The singing was absolutely beautiful. Lauren basically is Edith Piaf. Please go and see. Hello, my name is Martin Ottawa of Martin Ottawa Hypnotherapy. I specialise in smoking cessation, weight loss, phobia release, stress management and hypnobirthing. I can do a free assessment via the phone, via Skype or face to face at any time. So that's Martin Ottawa of Martin Ottawa Hypnotherapy. Looking forward to your call now. You can also find me on my Facebook page, which is Martin Oswell Hypnotherapy. Well, folks, we're back again uh, today. I'm speaking to Keith Edgerton, who's spent most of his working life in the bus industry. And uh, from the end of the last, he's just been and visited the front wheel of a bus. Um, but... Keith, we think I think we really need now to turn to from the past to the present, more to the present day. We have the situation now where I said drivers doing over 120 hours a week, or not a week, but in a block before they have a day off. Now the first thing that we did when myself and yourself um, held the positions within the union office in that particular garage was to abolish that. We stopped it. And we were accused by various members there of us trying to prevent them earning money. And we said, no, we're trying to present, prevent you killing yourself. And others. And others. Yeah, that's true. And possibly you getting dismissed. Because we had a series of drivers, if you remember, were fatigued and had accidents. Too many. And they said, but, you know, I was tired. To which the manager said, well, that's your fault. If you were tired, you shouldn't have gone out on the road, should you? I so said, there's no compassion. Everything back on the driver. Yeah, we, it, this is it the whole time. Um, of today, the driver's regulations the public service vehicle regulations. That's a lovely little thing cast in stone by Her Majesty's Government. Statutory instruments, yeah? Yep. We told that to TfL because they don't believe in it. Um, each vehicle is allowed to carry a certain number of passengers mm -hmm. under certain conditions. And it's called legal writing. It's on the bus, one wheelchair, number of passengers standing, number of passengers seating and the driver is expected to work to that. So he pulls up at a major stop and there is a major incident and a train is tipped out and he is allowed to put 80 people on his bus. So he pulls up and he's already got 60 people on his bus and as he pulls up he opens his doors and we'll say 40, 50 people force their way onto the bus, up the stairs, they move. He has no control over that. He can't stop that from happening. He can try to, but they will just go on the bus. What happens? If he gets out of his cab and says, well, no, no more gets on. He can't get out of his cab because he can't open his cab door because of the amount of people which has locked him in his cab. But physically, if he could get out of his cab and says, no more can get on. Right. In theory, great. In practice? In practice, Miss Jones phones up the bus company. He wouldn't let me on the bus. He point blankly pushed me off the bus. Discipline and you could possibly get the sack. The word compassion doesn't emanate from a manager's dictate now. 
it's all you will every penny matters and for every complaint they get they have to log that and it all goes down towards TFL and they say you could lose points and money for this you can be penalised what have you done about this driver doing this wheelchairs I was going to come to that one wheelchair is allowed on a vehicle but TFL print a lovely red book and it's called the big red book mm -hmm. and in it it states quite clearly that you are to let as many on as you can get you cannot stipulate just one you are obliged so if you dig your heel in and say no it's too dangerous I'm not going to and they complain if your cameras on your bus aren't working properly and you can't prove to your manager that you had a valid reason you will get disciplined and under the DDA now they're very harsh with their disciplines you'll get a final caution so you could go out on one route in one week and get three final cautions because it's a regular or just get sacked and then sacked yeah but so what you're saying then Keith is that TFL are actually going against what is the written law of the land yep but they haven't written a guideline down no. for a driver to follow no. so in other words if the driver takes course A he's wrong yep if he takes course B he's wrong if he takes call C, he's wrong. So the driver's always wrong. So whoever complains, yeah. he's but, not backed by the company, he's not backed by TFL. But the worst scenario is if you go down the road with an excess amount of people on your vehicle, idiot pulls out in front of you, you stop and you compress 10 people against the front bulkhead you've now had an accident and you'll get the sack for injuring people because you shouldn't have allowed that many people on the bus in the first place. And prosecuted for overloading the vehicle. Yep. But you can't physically stop them getting on board, no. whereas in the old days a conductor would go, sorry, full up. That's it. He was... And he'd count the number of spaces he'd have on yep. board. He used to pull up at the bus stop and say, first four. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Yep. And you're getting no backing from anybody else, so no. you're on your own. Now, at the same time, we also fought hard, very hard, for decent rates of pay. And we, until I left the industry, we were doing quite well. What's happened there? Well, it's stagnated. Um, I've been told, actually, it's gone backwards. Well, um, they've already cut overtime rates. Um, there was something on one of the programmes the other day where the government have said that they are going to introduce a minimum overtime rate. Well, which, because, um, whereas in the old days it used to be time and a half, now it's down to time and a third, and on some duties it's actually equal time. So you don't get a higher rate of pay for doing certain jobs. That's just unbelievable. Well, but well, we we used to have graded bands where okay, a, a first year driver would earn a lot less than somebody who'd been there. Um, in my case, it was seven years before I hit the top bracket. But you did progress gradually in yeah. between. But you moved up um, step by step. You moved up after two years, then yeah. after four years, then after five years, then after but, seven years. But now it's ten years. Right. So you join now and in ten years time your rate of pay will progress to the next level. You only go up one grade in ten years. Yeah. And we went up four grades in seven. Yeah, but... What you've got to remember is, 
you've got to live long enough within the disciplinary machinery to do 10 years. Because anybody that is getting close to the maximum rate of pay is targeted. Is that expensive? Yeah, you're too expensive, you need to go. Well, I noticed I dropped in to see some old friends at Croydon um, a few weeks ago. And I noticed that actually I looked at the seniority board. <laughs> and instead of me being about um, a quarter of the way down, I would have actually been probably about 10 from the top. Yeah. And I find that absolutely amazing because all of the drivers who still had years to go who were younger than me, a lot of them have gone. And when I asked colleagues there why, they said, oh, he went because of ill health. He went because his nerves are gone. Yeah. There's one chap who we all know well, little Steve. Um, he was off sick and he came back. He went out on a bus for a check to see whether he was okay for driving. He got halfway through the route, climbed out the cab and said to the instructor, I can't do this anymore. And that was a man who'd been a driver for what, 20 something years? He was an old London transport driver. Yeah. He said, I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> he never and he was shaking <laughs> from head to foot. In fact, he always used to moan at me. I only, apparently, I reported him once when I was an inspector, and he never forgave me for that. <laughs> I don't think Steve ever forgave anybody for anything. No. But, but as a man, He's a lovely fellow. A lovely man, and he was very, very good and hot yeah. on his health and safety. But if I remember rightly, they were always trying to penalise him over the fact he say, that is not right, it must be put right before that bus will go out. Yeah, that's right. He, and they were always after him, because you're just trying to deliberately lose time. You know, but you, you've got so many other things. Um, we hear lovely adverts done by TfL... Every journey matters. Don't use your phone whilst you're driving. Don't do this while you're driving. 6,000 buses have a phone in their cab and they're constantly being text. Once that text comes up, it pages you. Until you physically turn it off, it will buzz. It will just keep going bzz, bzz, bzz. So you are now being instructed. British law states you must not use a phone. It's but a phone the whole of the radio thing. system is a giant phone. And it's got a lovely text screen. And if you don't answer it, you get penalised. I called you at such and such a time, you failed to answer it, you're on report. So no matter what TfL demand that these radios are in the cab, but they also say don't use them. So you're not allowed to text by law? No. But yet they expect you to read a text that they send through to you to terminate the bus at a certain point somewhere? Yep. And the other thing I remember from my day, okay, perhaps before we came to the text thing, was that um, somebody will call you and you get the... And you're in the middle of a red route somewhere, driving, you could be in traffic or what's over. But you're driving. Yep. And then... Are you receiving me? Why aren't you answering? Are you receiving me? 246, are you receiving me? 246, why aren't you answering me? 246, okay, so what do they want you to do? They want you to start using a radio whilst you're trying to drive. If you're driving a coach, it says do not use the microphone whilst the vehicle is in motion. But they want you to do that when what you should be doing is pulling to the side of the road, which you can't because you're on a red route, yeah. and then using it. And of course, when you don't answer them, you're on report for failing to contact or take the instructions of the controller. Yep. Very true. So in other words, you're up against it in every direction. Yeah.
pay cuts, definitely we know that now. Just a quick example which I've got there. Across the Arriva companies, um, the pay ranges across Arriva in the UK can go from 17 to 25,000 pounds per year. The average London salary for the average London worker is £41,500 pounds per year. 41500 that's for the average London worker. The average Arriva London driver is on £23,000 a year. And that's for a very long, very, very, very hard route. Yeah. Unite the Union, who represent them, say that the figure should be nearer £30,000 a year for a bus driver as a tube driver starts on £49,673 per year. Bit of a difference, I earn £26,500 quid more than a bus driver. They're in a cab protect, protected from an abusive and sometimes often violent pub, public. Um, that's great. So we now know that the Reaver are actually paying less than £10 for new intake drivers. And yet Boris Johnson set the average London living wage. He said the London living wage needs to be £10.18 pence an hour. For a Reaver, it seems that the average wage Sorry, I've got that slightly wrong. My apologies. The, av the average wage across London for a reaver is £10.18 pence per hour. The London living wage for Boris Johnson was £9.15 pence an hour. And that's supposed to be the basic living wage. Yeah. So for somebody to drive a 12-tonne killing machine with up to 90 people on board through the streets of London for up to 12 hours per day, you get a pound more than the basic London living wage. That has now become disgusting. Yeah. But what you've also got to remember is, and I mean I'm not a great lover of them, but Arriva are one of the better paying That's very true. So what are these other companies doing, because they have the same disciplinary machineries. Hmm. Um, in fact, some of them, if you don't wear a tie, you're, yeah. you can be disabled. Yeah. Well, as I did point out, Keith, some of those companies, people are earning £17,000 an hour. Yeah. I think that's something to think on as we take a short break. And we'll be back in a moment. Lauren, and then what else did you sell on who's the behind the Happy News is in Maidenhead and she's got her own spot in Maidenhead, an office to have people come and to, um, to get involved in Happy News. She wants people to come and do Happy News, she wants people to come and help edit, she wants people to come and help and do all sorts of revolve around film. Maybe even photography, anything. networking, anything, related, anything re revolved around media and helping people. And this is a, a good thing because she's actually given people the opportunity to do all these wonderful things. She's given people the chance to say what it is they've got to say, to give the message it is they want to give. And that's a, that's a powerful thing, just to give people the space to be able to share what it is they want to share. And then she'll help you share, but you need to help share the movie on TV as a result. The more everyone shares, the more everyone finds about, out about this, the more people we can make aware of moving on TV, the more we can get people away from mainstream TV, which is just depressing. We don't want to be watching these standards. We don't want to be watching all of these programs. Or YouTube. <laughs> YouTube's depressing now as well. Yeah, YouTube, because they've got too much of a, a choice, I suppose, with, with, 
we, we, we just want people to have only positive material to look at. So moving on TV is the happy news and the chance that you can get to get on there and you can help with it, you can be part of it. Do so. It's the way to go. Lots of love and take care to everyone and in, in, enjoy your life. Happy Okay, welcome back folks. Well, I think we've um, gone quite in depth as to the lot of a bus driver nowadays and the way the situation has decreased and decreased over years for him. I certainly wouldn't like to be working in that industry now. Not at all. But Keith, um, just to top things off, I think we can say that all round in the industry, the training standards are nowhere near as good as what we helped put together. Oh no. The welfare standards... Okay. That's costs. Mm. The welfare standards are not as good. As a personal opinion, do, would you say that perhaps um, we have the big finger of corporate thank you, that's our take out of the pot has come into this? Well, yes, I mean, they used to keep on banging at us that we've got to look after the shareholders. Well, we're now owned by the German government. And there aren't any shareholders. You know, um, but we can keep the German economy going. Yeah, but at the British workers' expense. See. <laughs> and there's, unfortunately, a lot of our buses now are owned by either the Dutch or the German railways. Well, you, you won't show me one London bus company that is owned by a British company. Um, even, even Stagecoach. Hmm. You know, they're, they're, it, somebody said that this interview we should come up with um, some solutions. Well, one of the biggest solutions I can see is that I'm not saying it should be nationalised, but it needs to come under one umbrella. I agree with you completely. You need to have one controlling body that controls every bus company properly. Not as TfL holds a carrot up for you to say this, but to say, right, I'm going to pay Joe Bloggs £10.50 this week, I'm going to pay you £10.50 this week, and I'm going to pay you £10.50 this week. So that you have one standardisation of wages and working conditions because if you have those you're going to start to build the morale of the working man up because when I first started on the buses the morale was so high we used to have lovely weekend breaks you'd go down the coast to take the children out but they it used was to a allow buses to be proud of was yeah, it? yeah it, it was a profession oh yeah I, I, I was very proud of the fact that I worked for London Transport. Nowadays it's just a job. Well, um, when I went to, to buy my first house, um, and I said that I worked for London Transport, how much do you want? <laughs> now you say you work for London Transport, you're a bad risk. Yeah. Because you may not keep your job long enough. So the first thing that we need to do is get rid of the current tendering process, which is basically, let's face it, just driving down everything. Everything. It's driving and down standards. the price, driving down the costs. It's pushing the good people, the good professional drivers out. Because the buses that I've been on over the last few weeks, I've been thrown from pillar to post, I've been bounced all over the place, and literally, I've had the door shut on me as I've got off a couple of times. We've had one foot still on the platform and... Yeah, but they know you. No, quite possibly. Probably a lot of them know that I've complained about them at times. <laughs> when they've gone down the road where I live and over the speed bumps at 20 miles an hour. Yeah. And I've seen an old lady go flat on her face in the middle of the bus. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that's... I mean, we all joked about the penguin and... Oh, yeah. yeah. But they are more and more... A necessity for the driver to maintain that stupid 
headway which he's been given. Yeah. You know, um, when I was an inspector, headways never worked. It was always done on a timing basis. The reason for that was that if you had a three minute headway on one route, they could have bounced each other going down the road. Because one person pulls up at one stop, the next driver didn't leave that one. Go past. So the headway's smashed. Hmm. It doesn't work. No, no. But, um, so we agree that the tendering has got to seriously be looked at. And I remember Ken Livingstone standing outside Clapham Junction Station. And I think I mentioned this to you, and if I remember rightly, you watched it on television that evening. And Ken Livingston said, We are no longer going to give contracts for buses to cowboy operators. <laughs> we will no longer give contracts to bus operators who are going to give poor conditions to their workers. We are going to see the end of bus drivers sitting on freezing cold buses eating sandwiches for a break. Bus operators will have to provide a decent canteen service for their operatives and they will have to ensure that they have good conditions across the industry. That's a canteen at Croydon now, Keith. Closed. Oh. So what are drivers doing for their breaks nowadays? Um. Well, if you go, if you're on something like the four hundred threes, they sit on the bench at the Swan and Sugarloaf, um, looking at the traffic going past, eating a sandwich. Eating a sandwich. I said they bought sandwiches because they've not got time to get back to the garage, have something to eat from, oh, no. from, got... from the greasy spoon or the Chinese or the fish well, shop. Well, that's it. You haven't got that that time. So in other words, wherever your bus terminates, you sit there, you have something to eat out of wherever you can get it, um, a Marks and Sparks take away or... Yeah, if, you're, if you're lucky you're at West Croydon because TfL have built a bus station there and it's actually got a few facilities like a coffee machine um, and somebody's opened up a sandwich bar beside it. So we've basically gone back 15 years then? How many? Well, it was 15 about when Ken Livingston said we will not, we'll, we will no longer yeah. have drivers eating sandwiches on uh, cold buses. It's it's very gone backwards, but once again, um, drivers don't want rubbish food. No, you need good sustaining food, as we used to get at Croydon, where you could get meat, three veg, potatoes, and a but, decent dessert but afterwards. Then, along come somebody's bright idea, and they gutted Croydon Canteen out and turned it into a coffee shop. With very expensive prices. So, what we need then? End, first of all, to the stupid tendering system. Yep. Level playing field, which means bringing the buses back under one umbrella. Yes. And do you think people should start lobbying their MPs over that? I do, because... And their councils? Because the amount of government money that is spent on tendering, the profits aren't coming back into Britain. Those profits are going everywhere overseas. France, Germany, Holland, and yeah, yeah, right, etc. China, because we also have oh, yeah. the Chinese companies own one of the bus companies. So, if you was to utilise the money properly in the first place, the profits from the bus industry it's self funding. It always yeah. was self funding. Right. So we need better standards of training. Yes. Yes. Back to the old days, where Zariva got rid of all their instructors, bought in a new lot who didn't make the grade, and they, having made all their instructors redundant and paid them off, had to rehire a lot of them again. Which uh, is very clever. I, I've actually got to say, go ahead, have 
improved their training. Yes, because they've got a stack of Arriva's old instructors. They've also, if you look, they've made it far more uh, friendly because every instructor on Go Ahead has their own bus and emblazoned on the outside is a huge picture of the instructor. And it's a, it is a much friendlier system and they are actually we had in my day. Yeah, they are actually training. They're still, they're still training because some of them were London Transport trained. Hmm. They're still training the drivers properly. So if they can do it, why can't other companies do it? And I think the unions also let the bus industry down quite badly of late. We used to have a strong union in Unite, but the feedback I get from one of our ex-colleagues, Paul, is that the union now sort of um, are basically just shut up and be quiet with what you've got. And I'd love to. Back in our early days, there used to be a really fiery union man. His name was Tom Scanlon. Do you remember Tom Scanlon? He was. Well, if Tom... he was, he was a real firebrand until. He went up in the world and he became a regional. Hmm. And then he made some wonderful decisions. He became Toothless Tom. I remember him actually when we had another company went on strike and he asked us if we would provide extra buses to cover while their buses were on strike. Yeah. And the buses on strike were part of his union. That was absolutely a masterstroke yes. in trade union negotiation. I, I don't know if that helps um, the industry as such because the last thing you need is infighting in companies hmm. like that. You, ne you need to consolidate every company and get all the drivers on one footing. Well, it's been done. Wayne King and Roger Dillon did it when we were told over the Olympic Games, tube drivers, £800. It's yours if you promise not to go on strike. Train drivers, I think it was £500 if you don't go on strike. Um, what are the busmen getting? What do you want money for? You're getting nothing. Yeah, why, why, why do you want money? Uh, well, everybody else is getting it. So Wayne King and Roger Dillon got together and yes we went on strike and we got something in a region of a backhander in that way. We weren't asking for it originally but when they got it we wanted our share. Yeah. But that seems to be the way that the bus industry is treated. In other words, you're out of sight, you're out of mind, just go out on the road and do the job. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah. I mean, you're driving down the road, traffic lights go out, the radio call comes out from Centercom, use extreme care and caution going through. A tube, signals go down, everybody pile out, get on the buses because the buses are carrying you. That's true. So then, we know where we need to go and that is bring the buses back under one umbrella. Yep with a central control, we need to get proper training. I think we need definitely to put some of our managers on courses where they learn human relations skills. Man management. Is Man great. management, absolutely. And we need a union that will hold a policy whereby they will back their members. I'm not saying Red, I'm not saying go out, I'm not saying be absolutely rock hard, but say, whoa, fair is fair. Yep. Let's have an even playing field. But most of all, I think we definitely, definitely need some more investment in the buses, not in the technology that's making the job impossible to do. Is that I mean, a fair assumption? <laughs> TFL are introducing a system whereby if you're in a 20 mile an hour zone your bus will be restricted to 20 mile an hour. 
driver's not going to get any extra running time. Don't tell me. So then the company will say, you've been in, been running late all, all week. Yeah, you're failing to keep the headway. You're on a disciplinary. Yeah. Well, I think at that point, ladies and gentlemen, we've possibly run to the end of our time. But I think really we have to take into account the situation drivers find themselves now. If you want a happy driver, if you want a driver who's going to put his heart and soul into doing his job, then I think he needs your help as well. So why not start lobbying your local council to ensure that he's got facilities at his terminus, that the toilets are not always shut, which is one of the biggest problems that we find all over the place. Yeah. <coughs> you need to get on board maybe the bus companies to find out why they are closing their canteens and not having somewhere where a driver can get a decent sustaining meal during the day. You need good food to work. You can't live on egg and chips or bacon sandwiches. You can't in the middle of the winter live on salad and you can't take salad around in a plastic Tupperware box in a red hot bus during the summer. Can't leave it in the garage in the fridge. Where you can't sometimes get back to it. Because you can't get back there because you're going to have your break three miles away. So it's the greasy spoon or nothing. So that's an issue that we've got to look at. I think perhaps you mentioned go ahead. Maybe we need to look even further at their model as what they're doing training. Yeah, because they theirs has improved that the whole of their system. As I say, they've got some very good in, Arriva instructors over there. Well, now, that, that's who, uh, that's, that could well that be a wise. But I think also, the man who's at the top of the tree here, who should be answering some of these questions, is our mayor, Sadiq Khan. And we should be saying to Sadiq Khan, why don't you come here and discuss this with us? We'll put to you the points that the bus driver is saying, and what are you going to say to us, Sadiq? Are you going to say, well, yes, this is not a sustainable situation. Are you going to say to us, well, sorry, that's the way the companies want it, that's the way it's going to go? Or are you going to say, no, I'm going to intervene in this farcial policy whereby tendering is becoming so cutthroat, it's being cut, 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 cut money-wise all the time. Because all the time the tendering costs are going down, wages are going down, everything else is going down, the standards are going down, and... I will just give people one, unfortunately, negative thought on this. A tired tram driver in Croydon went into a microsleep a short while ago. The tram came off the rails and people were killed. When's that going to be a bus driver? So as I, as I, as I say, when is that going to happen to a tired bus driver who's worked 120 hours a week? But, maybe you've got an idea. Maybe you've got a positive on this. Maybe you've got some input into how this can be made better so that you see a happy, smiling driver when you get on your bus to go to work in the morning. Many people complain the driver was surly, he was grumpy, the rest of it. He's probably half shattered. I know, I've had the feeling. Keith knows, he's had the feeling. So, why don't you start lobbying? Why don't you call us, come back to us, whether it's email, whatsoever. Come to us and tell us how you think the lot can be improved. Because these guys need it. And having done the job, I can assure you as true as I'm sitting here, I can't do it any longer because my health failed on me and it failed due to the stress of that job. After 20 years, my body couldn't take it any longer. So I'd like to do something on this for my ex-compatriots, as I'm sure Keith would. So yeah. please come back to us. Give us an idea. See you soon. Well, one positive that we uh, do have to report, I'm pleased to say, 
is that the union rep Paul at Croydon has approached one of the ex-canteen staff who was very unceremoniously thrown out of the job down there when the canteen was axed and asked if she would like to come back and set up on her own to provide some, some form of service for the staff there. And she is at the moment, I'm glad to say, and I know who the young lady is, and she provides a very, very good standard of food. She is, at this moment, thinking about it very seriously. And it's fingers crossed that she does do it, because those guys do deserve their canteen. <laughs>